Get thee behind me, Satan. And she said he obeyed. He got behind me and said, wow, looks good from the rear, too. (laughs) Well, we blame Satan for all this kind of stuff. And um, really, uh, Satan is not really to blame. He is not the origin or the core of temptation. So let's find out, what does the Bible say? The Bible teaches that self is basically the origin of temptation. It is our own desires. We read in James chapter 1, verse 14, Each one is tempted when by his own evil lusts he is dragged away and enticed. Our desires, our lusts, our desires basically fall in two categories. First of all, our desire for a shortcut. Uh, For example, you see this in the temptation of Jesus, which we read about this morning. Jesus, at the time of temptation, still has the cross before him. He still has suffering that he has to go through. He still has the cross ahead of him. He has the crown of thorns and the pounding of the nails, the whole thing. So Satan comes and tempts him. Jesus has to go through all this suffering to to win victory over the evil one. So the evil one comes and says in verse 9 of Matthew chapter 4, All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. So he's tempting him, take a shortcut. You don't have to go through all that suffering and death and everything. You just bow down before me, and I will give you the kingdom that you want. A shortcut. Can you think of a shortcut in your life? What what example might we have of someone today? Uh, Take, for example, this young young student. He's um, uh, he's taking an English course, and he has to read all these books, probably six, seven, eight books there, and he's kind of... He's behind, and and, and the final exam is coming, and uh, he's been busy playing football. No, let's make it basketball probably on that kind of size, and uh, maybe a runner, but he's been so busy uh, in basketball. He's been practicing, practicing, practicing day and night, having all these games, and then he has girlfriends he has to keep happy, and then he works on the weekend, and he just hasn't had time to read all the books, and the exam is coming up. So the temptation is to figure out some kind of a shortcut. His desire is for an A in the course, and the goal is to ace the final exam. So he tries to work on a shortcut. How can he move from his desire to acing the exam? Can you think of some way? Well, how about cheating? Maybe he could buy the answers from someone. Or maybe someone else could take on his identity and take the, maybe an English major could take the test and he would get an A in it. So so the temptation is there to take a shortcut to achieve the goal. That's what Jesus was tempted with, and sometimes we are as well. So oftentimes it's simply a shortcut, but also it's sometimes just plain self-gratification. You see this in the temptation of Jesus. He's 40 days without any food. He is hungry. So Satan comes and says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. He tempts them in the area of physical and emotional exhaustion. That will happen in your life and my life. When we are physically or, or emotionally exhausted is a time when we face some of our greatest temptations. A while back, a survey was taken of pastors, and we found out that about a little over 30% of evangelical pastors are caught in the internet pornography sin at different levels. Some have got to the point where their level was highest, they've gone into adultery, and they've lost their ministry. So there was a, a survey of those who had lost their ministry because of this, and they were asked the question, Pastor, when you fell in this area, I mean, were you not studying God's Word? Were you not in His Word? Were you not? And the, everyone said, oh, yes, I was in the Word. I was preparing sermons. I was also marrying the living and burying the dead and trying to put out all the fires that occur in a church in a week's time. He said, I was totally physically, emotionally exhausted. And so I would come home and be tempted to just have some pleasure. And sin is pleasurable. The Lord never said it wasn't. 
But it's kind of interesting. The temptation came at a point of physical exhaustion, emotional exhaustion, and it caught, has caught a number of our pastors unaware. Well, this is a serious problem. So we would ask ourselves, well, um, how does this whole area of temptation work? So notice, secondly, this morning, the progression of temptation. It is very interesting as you study Scripture. For example, in James chapter 1, verse 15, it says, Then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Now, there are uh, three key words here. The first is desire. When, then, after the desire has been conceived, God has given us desires. There are many God-given desires. For example, take su success. I mean, God wants us to be success, God's full. God wants us to have blessing. But, but we're often tempted in this area. It's a God-given desire to cheat. So if you're a businessman, well, I could just cheat here a little bit, or, you know, I could, I could do that, and, and I've had people getting caught in embezzlement and so on, because I'll just cheat a little bit, and I can be more successful. I had one uh, deacon years ago in another state, another church, who was really tempted in this area, and he wanted to have a lovely home, so he began to embezzle funds. And it wasn't that God didn't want him to be successful, he tried to take a shortcut and do it uh, through, through a sinful act. But, but he, was, he was tempted in the area of a God-given desire. Uh, for example, take happiness. God wants us to have a full life. I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. God would want us to be happy. The problem is some of us go to happy hour. And, we take, and that's not what God wants. So we, our happiness is fine, but what we do to get that happiness, or I could embezzle this funds and get this thing and be happy about it, doesn't work. But we're tempted in the area of a God-given desire. I take one more, for example, that God, again, works on us, uh, gives us sexual de gratification, desires for sexual gratification, and God provides marriage and the fulfillment of all that, but at times we're tempted in this area. And so you might be pre tempted for premarital sex or extramarital sex, and you'll find that this gratification becomes a sin, and, and you become great, you know, really a rough time trying to, to work your way through and come back. And, but it was all a natural desire, but a natural desire that was, that was used the wrong way. And it usually was caused because of temptation in an area of weakness. For example, take uh, the Apostle Peter. He was impulsive and impetuous, and that's exactly where he was tempted when he said, I don't know that man. Or the Apostle Thomas, who was always doubtful and suspicious, and so he's the one that missed the resurrected Christ because he was out doubting being tempted as to the reality of his faith. And the apostles James and John, sectarian and belligerent. John and his brother were known as sons of thunder. And so they were tempted when something went wrong to blast those people. You know. But um, that's temptation in our weak area. And you'll notice that none of these were tempted sexually. We often think temptation, well, that involves sex. No, not necessarily in all areas of life. And so you have the apostles that were tempted, not in the area of sensuality, but in the areas of their own weakness. And so we have to determine, you know, what's my weakness and be very careful in those areas. For example, uh, what might your weak points be? Uh, how about uh, being tempted to steal or tempted to lie? How about simply temptation to be greedy or squander? your blessings. How about temptation to be envious or be hot-tempered? Maybe uh, feelings of superiority or inferiority or how about impurity or pride or tempted to 
usurp authority. Um, and you can make the list. And maybe you find yourself there or you can add your list. This is that area that I am always seemingly tempted to slip up. In other words, I could ask you this morning, what is your orange peel? What is your orange peel? And, um, well, what's your desire? You need to identify that. That's where the whole process begins. It begins with desire. And when we don't control that, the desire goes on to conception. So notice the second word here in James 1.15. Then, after desire has conceived, conception here means satisfying the desire at the wrong time or in the wrong way. It's a rather interesting um, how the writer does this here, how James looks at the whole idea of conception and sees that in relation to our temptation and sin. There's this, the desire. Now the conception takes place. If I let the sin actually take place, remember that conception here indicates an embryo. And embryos grow. And when it comes to the embryo of the sin that you've committed, there's no abortion available. It will be a birth. And that's exactly what happens. Pretty soon there's the baby. And when we look at conception and the embryo and the human life and the baby comes with a pretty little baby, cute and cuddly and, and, and tender, oh, just a sweet little baby. But notice in our text today that the birth is not pretty little baby. The, our text says, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to, to sin. And sin is ugly. Being a pastor for a few decades, you can imagine how many people I've heard pastor come in and they have had a desire and they have conceived. And now a birth has taken place. They're in this massive trouble and the birth is an ugly birth and it's basically loss. And so pastor, over the years, pastors, people will come to me and say, Pastor, I have lost my wife. I have lost my husband. I have lost my children. I have lost my job. I've embezzled. Now I've lost my job. I've lost my reputation. I have lost, lost, lost. It's an ugly, ugly birth. So as you look at that, you may say, what can I do? And maybe you're listening to this message and you're saying, hey, uh, that's me. I mean, I have desired and I have conceived and the birth has come and I'm dealing with the ugly result of the birth from what I got involved in. What do I do? What shall I do? Well, the Bible is real clear about this. So notice finally this morning the opposition of temptation. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 and 12, we read, Flee those things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, fight the good fight of faith. There are three words here that I hope you will remember. The words are flee, fight, and follow. Let's say that together. Flee, fight, follow. If you remember those and you follow those words, you're going to be able to have victory over temptation. Look at the first word, flee. You need to flee, we need to, to run away. When the desire is there and the temptation comes, you go in the opposite direction. An example is Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Remember Joseph, he just got out of there, left his coat of many colors, but he just got out of there before the desire became conception. You run, flee. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, verse 22, Flee the evil desires of you. Flee. Learn to run. If you have a problem with alcohol, don't stop by the bar on your way home from work just to see how your resistance level is. You stay away. If you're having problems with premarital sex with your girlfriend, 
don't go to her apartment alone